gentlemen. The last two lectures this afternoon are in the area of remedies relating to family law. The first of the two will be given by Her Honor Judge Rosalie Silverman Abella. Rosie Abella was called to the bar in March of 1972. She was in private practice in Toronto until June of 1976 when she was appointed to the Provincial Court Family Division. Most of us cannot go more than one week or two without seeing Rosie Abella's picture or some story about Rosie Abella in various periodicals, newspapers, Canadian lawyer, etc. But I will tell you um, that she was a commissioner with the Ontario Human Rights Commission from 1975 until February of 1980. She has since 1976 been co-chairman of the University of Toronto Academic Discipline Tribunal and has since 1977 been a member of the Premier's Advisory Committee on Confederation. And Rosie Abella, as any of her friends will tell you, has one husband, two sons, and a preeminently stable marriage. Her Honor Judge Rosalie Abella. Well, here we all are on a Friday afternoon. Those of you who are left, I being one half of the Abella Bastido show, which you will find at the bottom of your programs as two little subsections squished together and which represent together 10 credits. <laughs> now, think about it from my point of view. That makes me a five. <laughs> if I'm good. I asked Bastido if he'd give me some of his time so I could be a seven, and he said it wouldn't help. <laughs> but I want to tell you the story that Marv Katzman told me when I came whimpering to him with this lack of confidence, and this is what he told me to bolster my sense of confidence. He told me the story about a man who walked into the butcher shop and asked for a pound of brains, and the butcher said, well, what kind do you want? We have all kinds. And he said, uh, well, show me, what you've, show me what you've got. He said, well, we've got teacher's brains here. They're two ninety eight a pound. We've got engineer's brains. They're eleven ninety eight a pound. And we've got psychologist's brains for nineteen ninety five a pound. And the man said, what are these over here? They're twenty nine ninety eight a pound. Oh, sir, those are judge's brains. Judge's brains for twenty nine ninety five a pound? That's a lot of money. He said, do you have any idea how many judges we have to put together to get a pound of brains? <laughs> You'd think that Marv Katzman as a bencher would have a little more respect for the bench. The poor family law practitioner. In the past five years, he or she alone has had to struggle with fundamental changes to, or the repeal of, approximately 18 statutes. In addition, this woeful practitioner has had to cope with three revolutionary statutes with more pending. If it's any consolation to the bar practicing family law, the judges decoding it are not without their problems. Judicial discretion is the centerpiece of all the new statutory reform, and some of us are less discreet than others. Those who are more discreet are stunned into discretion by a confusing, conflicting array of statutory mandates. Consider, the Ontario Law Reform Act advises judges that conduct is out, no fault is in. But the Provincial Infants Act says conduct is still in, and so does the Federal Divorce Act. According to the Provincial Child Welfare Act, Best interest of children includes consideration of eight enumerated factors. Best interest under the Provincial Family Law Reform Act has no enumerated factors. And the Divorce Act doesn't even mention best interest since this is a legal maxim of the 70s, and the Divorce Act is a dinosaur from the late 60s. Support in the 80s is rehabilitative unless you were married in the 50s or mid-60s, in which case support is a form of restitution. If you were married in the 40s, Support isn't even a contest and comes with a court commendation for outstanding service to a cause we nostalgically remember as a nuclear family. <laughs> Custody is ordered according to new psychiatric and legal tenants unless, of course, the old one should apply. And this, in turn, depends on the psychiatrist, the child, and the court of appeal. 
And while judges everywhere are admonished by new provincial legislation to disregard morality and stick to economic distributions, the Divorce Act still requires moral assessments with the judge determining whether conduct has been suitably reprehensible to warrant giving legal recognition to a moribund marital relationship. Judges have thus, in their, in their divorce work, been singularly excluded from the operation of the otherwise universally accepted political nostrum that the state is not welcome in the bedrooms of the nation. But if the judges are administering provincial legislation, then the bedrooms are none of their business either, they being restricted by statute to the allocation of poverty between the parties. We share then, practitioners and bench, a plethora of aches and pains caused chiefly by a strong dose of legislative schizophrenia which leads to a high mortality rate in consistency and predictability. And this, depending on to whom you speak, leads either to a remarkable frequency in negotiated settlements to avoid the judicial gamble or to an exponential increase in litigation to test the odds. Whosever version one accepts, there is no escaping the fact that for now, perhaps inevitably until the jurisprudence has matured, there is a degree of confusion everywhere. But this lecture is supposed to be on remedies, not ailments, and will therefore focus on remedies in support and custody under the Family Law Reform Act, the Infants Act, and the Divorce Act. Because it is newer and therefore has been relatively free from academic assessment, the emphasis will be on what relief is available under the Family Law Reform Act. Please pretend that you have had the usual caveat about being an overview, I mean, what can you do in 30 minutes? And for details, you can read the book. I would not wait for the movie. <laughs> Miss Piggy starring as Judge Abella. Our look at remedies begins by focusing on what the laws are doing for and to children, recently recognized as priority items and who therefore now get studied almost as much as air pollution and get more press than Eddie Greenspan. We have become agonizingly preoccupied with children and they have thrown the legal system slightly off balance. Lawyers and the public seem unsure of what role family lawyers ought to play in representing a client when children are involved. Trained in law school to represent the client's interests, we find in family law, and particularly in custody, that there is urged upon the lawyer a hybrid approach to advocacy which involves consideration of two putative constituencies, the client's interests and the child's best interests. This is unrealistic and counterproductive. Until the adversarial forum changes, family law practitioners should be subject to the same critical scrutiny as their colleagues in other fields of litigation. That means representing one client's interest at a time to the best of your ability. Lawyers do not wreak havoc on families, the system does. People don't suggest that we take cars off the road because cars cause damage and inflict injury. They work at making cars safer and developing mandatory traffic rules. Without these compulsory rules, there would be chaos on the highways. And without these mandatory rules, there is a form of chaos in the family law field, with lawyers attracting, unfairly, most of the criticism for the mess. Leaving for a moment the problem of professional role clarification, we move to the law of custody. The three principal statutes under which custody are awarded, is awarded are the Divorce Act, the Family Law Reform Act, and the soon-to-be-repealed Infants Act. The test for custody determinations under the Divorce and Infants Act, as delineated in the legislation and case law, is, given the conduct and wishes of the parents, what does the child's welfare demand? The custody section of the Family Law Reform Act, section 35, says that custody is to be ordered in accordance with only one test, the best interest of the child. A review of the custody cases decided since this provision was enacted reveals an interesting dichotomy in the application of the test. There appear to be two disparate judicial approaches to the best interest test. The first, and I suggest the preferable judicial school, has taken the position that best interest is a brand new test. By being the only consideration the court must consider in ordering custody, any common law doctrines, presumptions, or principles that used to be applied in custody cases are no longer applicable. This approach rejects as inconsistent with Section 35 such hitherto axiomatic custody traditions as the tender years doctrine. This approach considers which of the applicants for custody of the child or children before the court is best able to accommodate the needs of the child. The second judicial school sees the best interest principle as not requiring a new approach at all. It is considered to be the statutory paradigm for 50 years of custody jurisprudence. These judges suggest that since courts have always acknowledged that what is most important is the welfare of the child, 
Section 35 merely codifies and therefore embraces traditional custody concepts. Best interest, they say, is therefore not an exclusionary concept, but rather an umbrella reference to traditional approaches in custody law. Both approaches, however, have this in common. The process ultimately culminates in an exercise of judicial discretion. The exercise of this discretion will inevitably result in a judicial diagnosis of what the facts propel a judge to conclude is best for a child. The judges are equal in their stated concerns for the welfare of the child, but they vary markedly in terms of their perceptions about what children need and in their willingness to wean themselves away from traditional custody principles. Whatever test is used, it's become increasingly frustrating for judges and lawyers who have no diagnostic or prognosticating skills to make informed judgments for and about the child. There has been, therefore, an increasing reliance on alternatives to judicial speculation in the form of psychiatric speculation. The combination of judicial with psychiatric discretion is at least, though, slightly more reliable than either of these forms of judgments on their own both as alternatives to litigation and as assistance in the process of decision making, these attempts through expert assessment to avoid or educate the court are most deserving of our cooperation and approbation. The one change which is generally acknowledged to have been made by Section 35 of the Family Law Reform Act is the custody and access remedy it, unlike the Infants and Divorce Act, gives to non-parental applicants. The section reads, either parent or any person can apply for custody or access of a child. This right to non-biological parents to apply for custody, plus the operation of the best interest test, has allowed the evolution and acceptance of the theory of psychological parenting. Biological ties in custody cases are no longer necessarily determinative. If it is in the child's best interest to remain in the custody of a person who is not a parent, but a person with whom the child has developed a healthy, stable relationship, this psychological parent may well be awarded custody over a biological parent with whom the child has no or a poor relationship. Under all three relevant statutes, three custody issues surface as increasingly significant. The first is whether interspousal conduct is something the court ought to investigate in a custody trial. Although adultery has been declared irrelevant in custody cases, do you know, you know the one about Moses coming down from the mountain? And he says, I got good news and bad news. First, the good news. I got him down to 10. Now the bad news. Adultery stays. <laughs> Although adultery has been declared irrelevant in custody cases, other breaches of morally and socially acceptable behavior have been considered determinative. Deserting, working, and homosexual mothers have all lost custody of their children in custody judgments released in the past year. And yet, the Supreme Court of Canada had said in the Tolsky case in 1976 that punitive custody awards were to be discouraged. Conduct, it said, was only to be considered in awarding custody if that conduct demonstrably affected parenting skills in the child's interests. Whether or not it does affect the child becomes a case-by-case -case determination. My own feeling is that spousal conduct is a damaging and usually unnecessary component in custody cases since prima facie, it's hard to see how a parent's moral turpitude has anything to do with his or her parenting. The second issue, which has received a formidable dose of judicial attention, is the matter of joint custody. Joint custody was, for a time, considered to be a slogan in search of a definition. Enter the Ontario Court of Appeal in Baker and Kruger. Both of these cases, the Baker and the Kruger cases, were decided under the Divorce Act. And in them, the Court of Appeal dealt ex extensively and negatively with the principle of joint custody. It said, essentially, that only where there is maturity, cooperation, and a non-adversarial approach between parents should custody be ordered. So should the Order of Canada. The remedy existed, it said, but only on the consent of the parties. The Court was without jurisdiction, in effect, to impose joint custody on parents. Though courts hearing custody cases under the Family Law Reform Act have held that joint custody can be imposed if it's in the child's best interest, the Ontario Court of Appeal adopted the converse proposition, namely, it can never be in the child's best interest to have joint custody imposed. There remains then this ambiguity of relief available with judicial thought divided between those who find joint custody a presumption devoutly to be wished and those who find joint custody an exception rarely to be. But since the latter judicial philosophy is espoused by the Court of Appeal, 
the concept of joint custody is, for the time being, only a tentative remedy to litigants in custody cases. The third significant custody issue is that of representation for children. Neither the Divorce Act nor the Family Law Reform Act provide this remedy, nor, for that matter, will the proposed amendments to the Children's Law Reform Act. But fortunately, the practice has grown of allowing children to retain counsel in custody matters, notwithstanding the legislative silence. The Reed and Reed and Roe and Roe cases both dealt with the issue, and though the latter expressed antipathy towards the concept, the former, through Mr. Justice Galligan, espoused it vigorously. For reasons I have trouble understanding, the concept of legal representation has been equated with the feeling that the tyranny of the young is upon us. It seems that it is one thing for adults to be concerned for the welfare of the child. It is quite another for the child to share and articulate this concern. Personally. I consider that legal representatives for children are a positive addition to the personnel who are part of the custody case package, adding as they do an essential dimension in a custody case, namely, what does the child want? Although anyone can apply for custody, the class of persons who can be compelled by court to pay support for children is limited to parents, in quotes. The principal statutes which give the court authority to order support for a child, now that the maintenance provisions of the Infants Act have been repealed, are sections 10 and 11 of the Divorce Act and part two of the Family Law Reform Act. The class of persons who can be ordered to pay maintenance under the Divorce Act are either of the natural parents as well as persons who have acted in loco parentis. Under the Family Law Reform Act, not only are natural parents equally liable for, su for the support of their children, anyone other than a foster parent who has demonstrated a settled intention to treat a child as a child of his or her family is included in the definition of parent and is therefore liable to pay support. Children are entitled to support under the Family Law Reform Act now, uh, whether they were born within or outside the marriage. The 1977 Children's Law Reform Act abolished the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate children, as well as laying down statutory guidelines for the determination of parentage and providing for blood tests to be ordered in any civil dispute as to parentage. But under both statutes, Family Law Reform Act and the Divorce Act, children under 16 have an absolute right to support from their parents. The Divorce Act has no upper age limit if the child of the marriage who is over 16 is unable to withdraw from parental care or provide himself or herself with necessaries. Under the Family Law Reform Act, with two minor exceptions, the upper age limit is 18. Parents under the Family Law Reform Act are not obliged, however, to pay support to a child over 16 who has withdrawn from parental control. This has introduced the concept of constructive desertion into the area of child support and has resulted in the courts having to determine, as they did in earlier spousal desertion cases, whether the withdrawal was voluntary or whether it was a result of intolerable circumstances experienced during cohabitation. Basically, except for the fact that conduct is irrelevant in child support, the test for support under the Family Law Reform Act is essentially the same in spousal and in child support. Namely, is the applicant a dependent within the meaning of the act whose economic needs can be accommodated by the financial ability of the respondent? The essence of a claim for spousal support lies in the status of the applicant determined as at the date of the application and lies in the fact of a dependency rather than in the fact of a relationship breakdown. Unlike the Divorce Act, the spouse need not be separated to get support. Awards of support are discretionary and are to be made based on need, ability to pay, and a list of factors enumerated in Section 18.5 of the Family Law Reform Act. These factors are not exhaustive, but rather represent guidelines for the court to consider in deciding whether and how much support should be awarded. Most judges have taken a textual approach to the allocation of family resources and have stressed what they perceive to be the philosophy of the legislation. This has resulted in an attempt to recognize in Family Law Reform Act support judgments the equal partnership aspects of marriage and the recognition that support is neither automatic nor necessarily indefinite. Awards have been made, therefore, for limited periods or in progressively decreasing amounts to permit and encourage a spouse to rehabilitate himself or herself economically and become financially self-sufficient. There has been, in addition, some discussion, judicial and otherwise, about whether to qualify for spousal support, the need must have actually flowed from the relationship. This perspective emanated from the sense that since the Family Law Reform Act reflected a recognition of the equality of spouses in a union, whether they performed the breadwinners or the homemakers function, 
and since each spouse was obliged by Section 16 to contribute to his or her own support, marriage should no longer be seen as an institution whose dissolution necessarily warranted economic adjustments. These adjustments should only be made, said the exponents of this theory, if the marriage relationship caused some economic disruption or disadvantage to either spouse. Support would thus not be automatic, but would be awarded only to diminish and reverse an economic dependency created by the relationship. Opponents of this theory suggest that the act is clear. Where there is need and the respondent spouse has means, support should be ordered. This school of support thought holds that part two of the Family Law Reform Act is not meant to indemnify marriage partners for economic losses. How the need arose, they suggest, should not affect eligibility. In practical terms, this debate has thus far made little more than a semantic, a semantic difference to the jurisprudence of support. Because so many of the factors enumerated in Section 18.5 actually embrace the concepts espoused by those who suggest that support should only be ordered to accommodate a need generated by the relationship, the differences in result have not been wide-ranging. The emphasis in most cases has been on encouraging, where possible, the swift development of financial independence. The fundamental difference in the approach to support between the Divorce Act and the Family Law Reform Act is in the weight the court is directed to place on conduct. Under Section 11 of the Divorce Act, the court may order maintenance for a husband or wife if it thinks fit and just to do so having regard to the conduct of the parents of the parties and the condition, means, and other circumstances of each of them. Under the Family Law Reform Act, however, the court is admonished by Section 18.6 not to consider spousal conduct in support applications unless the course of conduct is so unconscionable as to constitute an obvious and gross repudiation of the relationship. The fact of the conduct does not in any event affect entitlement, but it may affect quantum. This conduct provision was inserted in the Family Law Reform Act on the recommendation, among other groups, of the Ontario Law Reform Commission and against the recommendation of the Federal Law Reform Commission. As a result, many judges and lawyers have carefully watched the jurisprudential evolution of this subsection to see whether the Jeremiads of the federal or of the provincial reform bodies would prove accurate. In fact, what has happened is that they both turned out to be right. Although most judgments involving conduct have stressed that to be relevant, the conduct must be gross, there exists nonetheless a significant difference in per perceptions of degrees of grossness. In any event, it seems to me that the notion of fault assessments essentially collides with the overriding support philosophy of the Act. In a statute which emphasizes the equality of spousal functions and the reciprocity of spousal obligations in a family, it is hard to see where there is room for anything resembling retributive justice. The Family Law Reform Act was meant to assist the spouses in making economic adjustments which fairly reflected their mutual and equal contribution to the former relationship. Moral assessments are prima facie irrelevant to the economic analyses envisioned by Part 2. Persistent efforts by the courts, therefore, as reflected in some of the case law, to limit the admissibility of this kind of evidence and support applications are therefore salutary. Whether support relief is sought under the Divorce Act or the Family Law Reform Act, the court is obliged to take into account any division of family assets. This means procedurally that any property claims are to be disposed of prior to maintenance being awarded. The courts are thereby free to use maintenance or support orders creatively to make financial adjustments for spouses which redress inequities and imbalances created by the distribution of assets. If the spouses are parties to a domestic contract, which is in writing, signed by the parties and witnessed, and which may include a cohabitation or marriage contract or a separation agreement, it will make a significant difference whether support proceedings are being brought under the Family Law Reform Act or under the Divorce Act. Under the Divorce Act, the courts have held, with impunity, that their discretion is not fettered by the provisions of the separation agreement dealing with support, and they may, in granting corollary relief, replace them entirely. I find this practice unsettling, particularly in view of the court's persistent urging that parties settle their grievances by agreement. There is little incentive to do so if these agreements can later be routinely overturned by the court. Under the Family Law Reform Act, contracts are treated with somewhat more respect, there being a presumption that the terms of a domestic contract dealing with support prevail and cannot be set aside unless they fall within a few exceptions like unconscionability of result or the best interest of the child. 
In interim applications, it is really unclear what guidelines are meant to apply. Section 10 of the Divorce Act provides that interim alimony should be ordered in whatever amount the court thinks fit and just, having regard to the needs and means of each spouse. In one recent case, this has even included the right to order an interim swimming pool. Section 19.3 of the Family Law Reform Act says the court can make any interim support order it considers appropriate, and there is therefore obviously a wide discretion under both acts. The general approach seems to be what amount should be ordered to allow the dependent to live comfortably during the adjournment period, considering the standard of living formerly enjoyed by the applicant and his or her current rather than prospective expenses. Interim support will probably not be ordered where a dispute as to liability is raised, where, for example, a father denies paternity or a husband relies for his defense on the provisions of a valid separation agreement. The denial of interim support is to avoid prejudicing the respondent or prejudging the issue. The theory apparently is that the trial judge can order payments at least back to the date of the application and possibly prior to it if the defense was without merit. Whereas if interim payments had been ordered in an application, which turns out to have been without merit, there is often no way payments can later be recovered. To enforce any support order, execution and garnishment are available, as are the enforcement provisions found in sections 27 to 32 of the Family Law Reform Act. The onus in enforcement proceedings is on the debtor to satisfy the court that the default is owing to his or her inability to pay. In enforcing a support order, the court may use attachment, may require security for payment, or may charge a property of the debtor with payment of an amount. As a last alternative, if it appears that no other means of enforcement are available, the court can order outright or conditional imprisonment for up to 90 days. And at the end of all of this, can you at least get costs? It's hard to tell. Costs have been the stick and carrot of family law for the past four years. There are no predictable awards of costs in family matters which are automatically attracted by a successful outcome. The Court of Appeal in Andrews and Andrews has recently held that in fact, costs should not necessarily be awarded to the successful party in a family dispute. Success is only one factor to be considered, along with the reasonableness of offers of settlement made, the conduct of the parties during and prior to litigation, and the income and assets of the parties. This may result in no cost being awarded where, for example, a successful party has unreasonably rejected a sensible offer. The conclusion from all of this has to be that though the remedies themselves are relatively straightforward, the fact of custody, support, enforcement, the proliferation of options, both in procedure, forum, and in result, makes this an area of law which could use better clarity, consistency, and structure. Some of the modern aspects are healthy. The trend away from judgmental judges and the emphasis on alternatives to litigation being two such examples. But others, such as the existence of parallel yet inconsistent statutes for the same remedies, are, though constitutionally explicable, remedially confusing. Perhaps eventually the public, offended by this inability to ascertain their rights, will demand radical non-intervention by the legal system in this very private area of their lives and demand instead accountants to sort out their support problems, psychologists and doctors to deal with custody, and administrators to end their marriages. It is possible, though, to look at the positive side of all of this confusing array of remedies. There's certainly a lot of flexibility. And I do like to think that we've made great progress in the philosophies we've espoused in our new legislation. But though this philosophy is an important context, we have yet to deal sufficiently with the need for equally creative systemic and structural remedies. Believe it or not, after all these years, we're still on a threshold of family law, and that's no small comfort. Thank you. The second half of the Abella Bastido 10 is Tom Bastido, who will talk about remedies in family law relating to property. As we did yesterday, we find that Tom Bastido has a curriculum vitae that is surprisingly small, but it's surprisingly small only because of his modesty. He got his LLB at Osgoode Hall in 1969, was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1971. He is senior partner of Bastido, Cooper, Kluak, Caro, and Shostak, and though his curriculum vitae doesn't say so, those of us who know him can say so. He is 
one of the most active and most experienced counsel in the City of Toronto and has considerable expertise in the area of family law, Mr. Tom Bastido. Of course, entirely appropriate that I come at the bottom of the day because, as you know, um, we're the pits of the legal profession and work in the trenches. Um, for those of you who practice in the more esoteric uh, types of law, you may not be able to grasp the flavor of the sort of work that we do. And I received a letter this morning which I'd like to share with you. We have two piles of types of letters in our office, the so-called good letters and the bad letters, and I'll leave it to you to decide which category this should be. This really arrived in my office this morning. Dear Mr. Bastido, since this case seems to be rolling right along all by itself so effortlessly, <laughs> I guess my impatience is simply foolhardy. But due to my increasing old age and those of my children, <laughs> they will soon not need child support. <laughs> as at this rate they will be adult before we get a small hearing in court. I took the law into my own withered hands <laughs> and visited my ex-husband and after a short meeting we have resolved a number of issues. If sometime soon, underlined five times, between days off and vacations you would apply yourself to the <laughs> to the tiny, underline five times, task of getting a court date, we could get all the other matters resolved. <laughs> anyway, that's what I have to put up with. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a lot of time today, and I'd like to really talk in generalities and uh, in principles. I intend to cite few cases, uh, intend to read no extracts from the law or from cases, and to deal somewhat in principles. It's ironic with all the criticism of the courts that it was the courts in the early 1950s in this province that attempted to expand in some way the strictures of the common law and to add an ingredient of discretion into what they were trying to do. Of course, this produced a chaotic uh, situation and a generation of lawyers grew up trying to interpret cases such as Jallo and Jallo and Davis and Davis. The discretionary power of the courts was first surveyed in these lectures, so as far as I can understand, by Mr. Evans, as he then was, in 1961. And the importance which this aspect of the law has been accorded by the Law Society can be calculated in empiric terms by the fact that since 1950, two lectures have been given in this subject, the two single lectures. It uh, perhaps solves my impatience at being given only half a lecture by the fact that I was allowed to share it with Judge Abella. In any event, the family law report, or the family law report in, 19, in the early 1970s put forward a scheme which is entirely different from that which was brought into effect. And that scheme was really an equalizing scheme. And that problem really is the problem which we face in the day today. It is important then to understand that the Family Law Reform Act, insofar as property concerned, does not really attempt, and in fact does not attempt in any way, an equalizing situation. And it is perhaps ironic that the word remedy, which comes from the Latin word remedium, means something curative or healing. Now, there's, of course, nothing curative or healing about the property provisions of the Family Reform Act, Family Law Reform Act. And in fact, they are more dealing with economics than any other aspect of our life, perhaps in the sense as well that they are both regarded as dismal sciences by many people. The foremost aspect or knowledge or quality that a family law practitioner can bring to a client is common sense and good judgment, but on the other hand, he or she must tell the client 
that what is going to come out of the court is usually good sense, but the judgment, and I hate to say this, is usually quite common. Now, His Honor Judge Clements, in a recent case called Campbell and Campbell, uh, dealt with the scheme of the Family Law Reform Act in terms of partnership. And there are basically two types of partnerships that are involved in the Family Law Reform Act. And one is a business partnership, and the other is a domestic partnership. And the whole problem dealing with this act is to determine what kind of partnership we are involved in, and then to divide the assets by reference to that partnership itself. As you're probably aware, there are a number of different types of remedies. The legal remedy, and that is the statutory criteria which is set into the act. There's an equitable remedy, and that equitable remedy is given to the judges by the equitable provisions of the act. And then there are what is commonly called extraordinary remedies, and those extraordinary remedies are contained in the act as well. So we have all different types of remedies in the Family Law Reform Act and I would like to deal with those in the next few minutes. Now, what I intend to do really is to just pick out certain problems which uh, I see as being raised by the Act and uh, deal them with, with them really in what can only be a cursory matter. It is uh, easy to forget that the term family assets was uh, disavowed by the English House of Lords in 1969 after being brought into that jurisprudence in the mid-1960s and that concept is a revolutionary concept in the law, equivalent, in my view, to the development of the trust law in the 15th and 16th centuries. This is a new type of law with which we are dealing. And obviously, there are certain problems which have arisen. Now, in Ontario, there are basically three types of problems dealing with the categorization of family assets. One of them is, of course, that relating to ownership and use, because that is the test of the family asset. And His Honor Judge Steinberg, in a case called Taylor and Taylor, uh, I thought very appropriately analogized that type of use to the use of ordinary user under, or ordinary resident under the Income Tax Act. There must, of course, be a cumulative usage and the vague intention of settling a use in the future is not sufficient. The second type of uh, use relates to the ownership problem. Now, I don't intend to say more than a sentence on this, but significant problems arise by concealing ownership behind a trust or a company, and a particular problem arises in respect to the definition of shares because it's very difficult to allocate a share value to an asset if the, on the total balance sheet of the corporation the, uh, as the share has uh, no particular value. That problem has not been dealt with in the courts. The third type of problem is what I can call the extension of the use or the extent of the use. For instance, if jewelry, and this is going to be a particular problem in the future, if jewelry is owned by spouse A and worn by spouse B, is that jewelry a family asset? Now, there's a case in British Columbia that says it is. It becomes particularly important if a significant portion of the assets of the partnership of the husband or wife have been invested in jewelry for some social or uh, economic reason. Of course, there, are, there is an onus on the party alleging that a family asset is a family asset to show that, in fact, it is. There are three types of situations in which Therefore, the family asset identification becomes important, three common types anyway. One of them relates to a recreational property. As we all know, different spouses have different habits, and many, many situations arise in our practice in which one spouse has a recreational boat or a farm or something like that. The other spouse uses it very occasionally, and it becomes very important in the distribution of the family assets as to whether that is or is not a family asset. The second problem relates to farm property, and I think that problem has pretty well been solved by the Ling case, in which it has been now fairly conclusively determined that the family asset on a farm is only the house 
and the necessarily adjacent property in Demi to the use of that house. And the third, excuse me. Let, let me deal, uh, while I'm on this, about farm properties for another moment and uh, deal with matrimonial homes. I'm sorry to interrupt the train here, but it comes more logically. Uh, the Ling case and various other cases show that it is extremely important still to determine, if you are a lawyer dealing with a client, how property is to be held. Now you recall in the Ling case, that property was conveyed as joint tenants. If that property had been conveyed into the man or into the woman's name, entirely different considerations would have arisen. I was involved a little while ago with a case in which the, the residence was a doctor's office for the bottom third and the top two thirds were uh, used as the family residence. It was clear from the judgment that only the top two thirds were the matrimonial home or the family asset, but because the whole house had been held in joint tenancy, then the property was split. So I think it's important when advising your clients not to lose sight of the fact that the type of way in which the property is held is of importance. The other area of extreme importance that this arises up in is with respect to creditors' problems. And as you probably know, it is the division of the property doesn't take effect until application is made. And in a recent case, uh, we had a client who was bankrupt the house is worth $200,000 put into his wife's name by a rather complicated trust agreement. The whole $200,000 was passed right by the creditors and put into the hands of the children. And then in the end, it would come back to the husband. So it's very important to uh, determine this rather clearly. Now, I have two other comments on family assets. First of all, uh, DeFasco, in addition to its many other qualities or attributes, has been almost entirely responsible for shaping the law with respect to pensions in the province of Ontario. Judge Steinberg said he could quote the profit-sharing plan of DeFasco by heart, and uh, you will see in the decisions of the Unified Family Court a series of cases which state that pension rights in Ontario, at least so far, are not family assets. This, this, this problem has come once before the Court of Appeal, but the facts are so sketchy, that case is called St. Germain, the facts are so sketchy that it really can't be uh, regarded as uh, of much use. Uh, in a case called Foot versus Foot, Mr. Justice O'Leary stated the rather startling proposition that if income comes from a particular body of money, that body of money is not a family asset. Now that's contrary to the strict wording of the act, but as his lordship says, to hold otherwise would in effect be an absurdity, and the obvious way to treat money which comes from a business is to put it into one account, move it from one account into the other account, which is then used as just a cash flow basis for uh, the uses of the household. Now, uh, having briefly surveyed the family assets, we come into the problems dealing with Section 4 of the Family Act. Uh, family Act. And given the division of the Act into assets which are family assets, which are non-family assets, and given the decision of the legislators to reject the community of property regime or some version of it, and yet assuming that some rigid topology would create obvious inequity, Section 4 is an attempt to give to the public at once a code which ordinarily applies and on the other hand, a means to the court to redress the inequity. Mr. Justice Le Cursier in Leatherdale and Leatherdale says that in my view, the court is required to redress inequity where it exists. The problem, of course, is to determine where inequity exists. And this is the, the major problem relating to property under the Family Law Reform Act. Of course, under Section 4.4 of the Family Law Reform Act, the court may make a division of family assets resulting in shares which are not equal. But 
and this is forgotten by many of the judges and lawyers, but only after it has considered all of the equitable considerations. As is stated in a, a well-reasoned case called Quick versus Quick by His Honor Judge McWilliams, the division of the property is subject to the equities. Now that conflicts somewhat with what Mr. Justice Galligan said and which Mr. Justice Henry said in the Silverstein and Bregman cases respectively. And while it is true that the onus is on the applicant to establish inequity, and while it is also true that prima facie there must be an equal division, nevertheless the equities must be considered by the Act. Now, in a case called Biafore by Mr. Justice Anderson in Windsor, he, his lordship, attempted to wrestle with this problem, and he says that every legal system must at times find the peculiarly hard case that cries aloud for relief, the case which no judge could decide according to the rule without putting an intolerable strain on his own conscience. Consciences, of course, vary from judge to judge. And I invite you to look at three cases which are roughly similar. The Erzak case, a case called McClellan and McClellan, and a case called Sanos and Sanos. All of these cases deal with uh, marriages which are short. All of them deal with houses which were acquired. And, all of, and each one of them is decided in a different way from the marriages from three years to six years. And it's very, very difficult to get any sense of what is equitable and what is not. So there has been very little guidance from the courts in dealing with Section 4.4. And in a recent case called SEIBT, that's S-E-I-B-T, the Court of Appeal was given the opportunity to comment on how the provisions of Section 4.4 should be applied I won't repeat all those for you. That was Mr. Price's case. Everybody's pointing at Alan Price. Anyway, uh, Alan tells me that in that case, Mr. Justice McKinnon sim simply stated that the trial judge had made a decision and uh, that was good enough for him. Um, this, is one of the, this is one of the areas in which we need guidance from the judiciary. Now, after having dealt with Section 4.4, then we have to put in the Joint Contribution Agreement uh, section, I'm sorry, of Section 4.5. And you'll remember that this section deals with the so-called joint contribution of both spouses. However, uh, as we all know, while all may have been created equal, all do not necessarily end up equal, and it is uh, misleading to think that that result is going to affect, in many substantive ways, the determination of assets. What it does to, however, is give to the judges either upwards, and I'm looking at the page of the statute, either upwards to section 4.4 or downwards to section 4.6, a way of dividing on the one hand family assets, which was done in Weir and O'Reilly, or on the other hand dividing non-family assets, as was done in Bregman. In the Bregman case, Mr. John, Justice Henry's statement is of importance, where he says the inequity in these circumstances may therefore arise because division of the family assets is inadequate to reflect the full extent of the role of wife and mother and the husband's financial success. The problem, of course, arises in the situation where it is clear on the facts that the wife has not done that. And there are two recent cases which are, I think, of seminal importance for an understanding of the deficiencies of the Family Law Reform Act in this regard, if one would call it that. One is the Tillman case, and the other is a case called Pariti by Mr. Justice Osborne. And let me read you one sentence from what his lordship says. In my view, section 46B2 requires a finding of fact that the assumption of responsibilities of household management, child care, or financial provision have resulted in a spouse being able to acquire or improve non-family assets. Therefore, if that ingredient is not present, then the most that the court can do is to divide family assets unequally. If the family assets are either non-existent or not sufficient, then what we will have is an asset position on the one hand 
of the husband having, say, $1 million and the wife having $100,000. Now, the way the courts are dealing with this is to use the Divorce Act once again to distribute property in the guise of calling it maintenance. And you'll recall in the apogee of the lump sum maintenance awards in the, in the mid-1970s that the courts regularly did that. And a good example of a case more recent than that is a case called Watt and Watt, where Mr. Justice Brook in the Ontario Court of Appeal said, in essence, where there's an obvious inequity, there should be some other division. The problem, of course, is for the practitioner and for the litigant that it is very, very difficult to assess that in a large, quote, large case. And all one can do is guess, really, and hope that one's clients accept the recommendation or alternatively go to the trial. Now, I deal very shortly with Section 8 because my colleague, Professor McManus, has dealt at length with constructive trust. And I don't really wish to say anything about that except for this. The issue in the Leatherdale case was simply whether or not there had to be a direct contribution to the specific asset in order to create an obligation under Section 8. Leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada has been given in the Leatherdale case. And the issue there will be whether one agrees with Mr. Justice Le Courcier or one agrees with Professor McLeod's annotation in the Family Law Reports that, quote, there is no reason why Section 8 contribution should be restricted to direct contribution. Now, if the Leatherdale case is overcome, that is going to quite drastically change the jurisprudence in this province because what it will do is it will change around the problem which I have given to you with respect to the Tillman and the Pariti case and allow the judges to use Section 8 where they've been using the Divorce Act at this time. And if I may add something in parenthesis, what all this shows is that there is an obvious need to amalgamate both the property and the Divorce Act. I assume that's going to happen in the next two years because of Mr. Trudeau's thrust. And that's clearly going to be the next issue in family law, is putting Ontario's Divorce Act together with Ontario's Family Law Reform Act, leaving the recognition provisions to the federal government. The Section 8 does not obviously eliminate a constructive trust argument. And it can be argued that Mr. Justice Dixon's decision in the Petkus case is harsher than Section 8. However, I leave it to you to use a constructive trust argument that the statute doesn't eliminate it, and it is another tool which uh, by now you will be familiar with. I wish to deal uh, uh, briefly now with uh, restraining orders. Uh, under Section 9, I refer you briefly to the case of Magot and Magot, and that case says that the restraining order on a non-family asset is much more difficult to obtain than a restraining order on a family asset. Section 45.3 of the Family Law Reform Act deals with exclusive possession. Now, that code, in my view, is exhaustive. And it shows really no uh, even development in the trial bench. I will say to you that in my experience, in my talking to others, that if you are attempting to obtain an exclusive possession order at the trial level, and you either obtain that or do not obtain it, it is almost impossible to upset that in the Court of Appeal. And so it is uh, very important at that level to deal with the uh, problems with the children of facing and obtaining new accommodation and so on. The statute reads harsher than it, acts, than it comes out in practice. And in most situations, although not all, the judges are very sympathetic to the plight of the wife and the children. And in my view, the determining factor, although it probably should not be, the determining factor is not the plight of the wife and children, but the availability of the assets or other assets to the husband. 
And so if the husband has sufficient other assets, it is not really a hardship and the property uh, will be uh, kept in an exclusive possession order for the children. If on the other hand the husband has no assets, if he's young and he, uh, the house is worth maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars by terms of net equity, it will invariably be divided and there's a series of cases that deal with this problem. Interim uh, exclusive possession uh, is in jeopardy. Uh, probably some of you know of the Paul Glazy case in the Supreme Court of Canada. That case has been argued, but judgment has not been delivered. If the British Columbia Court of Appeal decision is upheld, the following results will occur in this province. The master will have no power to give an exclusive possession order. The family court judges will have no power to give exclusive possession orders, no power to grant molesting orders, no power to give custody, and will uh, involve a complete rewriting of the Family Law Reform Act. Therefore, because of the Leatherdale case and because of the Paul Glazy case, these comments uh, may be have to uh, reword it in the next several weeks. There is already significant argument and no cases in Ontario of any importance which go to show that these, case, these uh, thrusts equally obtain in the province of Ontario because, of course, uh, going on the argument that Section 96 judges are the only judges that can give injunctive type of relief, then the other types of judges, such as Masters and Family Court judges, should not be able to do that. I wish to deal finally, very briefly, with the problem of retroactivity under Section 11 and 12 in the several sentences. There are three cases of importance. There is a um, case in the Ontario Court of Appeal called McLaren and McLaren that is a divided decision in terms of reasoning, although the result is the same. There is a case, a recent case by Mr. Justice Craig called Pritula, P-R-Y-T-U-L-A, and another case uh, decided by His Honor Judge Bernstein in Cochrane called Papineau versus Chartron. Now, the answer to the question, is Section 11 and 12 retroactive? The answer to the question is sometimes. In respect of property in which two parties were married prior to 1978, and that property was disposed of before 1978, the Pritula case and the Papineau cases come to opposing results, both cases relying on the Court of Appeal decision of McLaren versus McLaren and it is of importance to read these three cases extremely carefully if you are involved in a case in which the allocation of property interests, which were, these are cases in which property is already disposed of before 1978. And it is still possible, especially, still possible if those parties are married to bring claims. If the parties are divorced by a very in my view, uh, depending on your point of view, involu uh, innovative or convoluted type of reasoning in the McLaren case, Mr. Justice LeCursier says that you cannot seek the benefit of part of the act and not have the benefit of the other part, you're being divorced. Because if you're divorced, you don't have the benefit of Section 4, you have lost the presumption of advancement, and therefore you're out of luck both ways. And he gets around that by saying in that case, you shouldn't have either. I'm sorry these comments have been somewhat jumbled together, but I've done, uh, I've tried to give you an overview, and I hope you'll look forward to reading the 75 pages when it's finished. Thank you very much.